graduation information. Have you ordered your cap and gown? How many of you placed your order in December for your cap and gown invitations? Perfect. If you have not ordered your cap and gown, um, we need to go, you need to go ahead and order it. At least let's get it in your cart today before we leave here. Because um, in the past, what we've done as a senior class, they come in and they fill out a sheet with their height and weight, and Justin goes ahead and orders a gown and puts it on reserve for them. This year we didn't do that. They were not able to come in, so you have to go online to order it. So let's make sure to do that so that you have one on reserve for graduation. Um, the cost, if you just want a cap and gown, is $61. Okay, they divide that up into four payments. I think it was like 15 something a payment for you. But go ahead, everyone go visit either on your Chromebook, on your phone, this website, secampussupply.com. And we're going to walk through this and put it down in the cart for you. If you order, George, just hang loose. If you not, let's go ahead and get this in the cart. So you can go to it and it's loaded when it comes time to get it. Okay. If, um, let's say you don't have the $61 that happens, you don't have $61 to pay for your gown, there are resources to help pay for your gown. 
So if you would please see your guidance counselor, Ms. Phillips, Mr. Crawford, myself, Mr. Johnson, Mr. Pierce, we will make sure that you have a gown to wear for graduation. But we need to know, you know sooner rather than later. So it's SCCampusSupply.com. Are you ready? Anybody still trying to get that website uploaded? Okay. Okay, so once you go to the website, um, you go up to the graduation at the top, and when you click graduation, you'll have to select a school name. So be sure that you select Ringgold, not Lafette or Lakeview. Just make sure we have Royal Blue down, not an orange one or a red one. And then this is, these are the packages. They list all the packages for Ringo High School. I mean, the packages are really expensive, some of them. Um, you can decide which one you want, but if you just want your gown, you have to scroll all the way to the bottom of this page to see all packages. And then you scroll all the way to the bottom again. They try to get you to buy these packages. You do not have to buy a package. To shop individual products, And then again, at the very bottom, it'll say shop cap and gown, I believe is what it says. Shop cap and gown. Then it'll pull up a picture of our cap and gown. And it is $61, four payments, $15.25 each. So you have to put in your height. And this is important, you don't want one that drags the ground and you also don't want one that is um, up to your knee. About mid, cap is where it's supposed to get. And then your weight. Please come within at least 20 pounds of your weight. No one else sees this, but they'll. And then you choose the option. They're the same, so I don't know why it does that. There used to be like the female gowns came with like this little white thing to put like a collar. And I guess that's why, but we don't use those. If yours does come with a collar, those little white collars or whatever, just a little piece of fabric lace, just throw it away. You don't need it. And then add it to your cart. Okay, so go ahead and do that. And that way you can just save it in your cart and later on you can pay for it. But it's at least we know that it's there. Okay, just screenshot that, send it to your mom that you need to order that. Alright, you may have any questions about cap and gown orders. If you do, please just come see me later and we'll make sure that you get it ordered. It's not a day, it's night, but that's when all your awards are announced. 
All your scholarships are announced, and Mr. and Ms. RHS is announced. Baccalaureate is May 16th. It's going to be at Reno United Methodist Church. And this is just like a last moment of reflection for seniors. It's like a church service. It is not required. It's not required. But it is like a last moment. For those of you that want to go participate, you can. May 20th and 21st, we're going to have graduation practice in the morning. So go ahead and make sure that you don't plan anything for those mornings. The 20th and 21st, we'll have graduation practice. And then graduation day, of course, is May 21st, that evening. We'll have graduation. So put all these dates in. Make sure you don't schedule anything for the 20th or the 21st during our practice times. Do you have any questions about advance or dates? Do you just send it in that? All right, so graduation activities attire. What do you need to wear? Gentlemen, you need to have some khaki pants, a white button down shirt, a tie, and some dress shoes. Please refrain from wearing tennis shoes, flip flops, or sandals. Okay, so khaki pants, white shirt, and tie. Ladies, you need dress and dress shoes. Make sure in your dress shoes that you wear wedges. But if you wear heels, make sure that there are wedges. I mean, you can wear sandals or things like that, dress flats. But if you wear heels, make sure they're wedges because I don't want you to stick into the turf and fall on your face. Okay, because like stilettos and stuff may dig into the turf and stick. Um, if you need help with any of these items, finding these items to wear, financially, just let one of us know and we will find them for you. Okay, we'll help you. Only school issued regalia may be worn at graduation. So any of your clubs or organizations here at school, if, they, if you get like a stole, a cord, any of those things to wear, your medals for your class path, for your pathways, those are fun to wear as long as you it's issued from the school. Okay. And then please do not add designs to your caps. Okay, on the top of your cap. Don't decorate it, save that for college. That's a college thing, not a hospital. Hey guys, I'm gonna talk just a second about ACT. Uh, raise your hand if you have taken the ACT like ever. Oh, good, that's pretty good. I'll be able to take that. Uh, raise your hand if you've not taken it yet. Okay, so you guys are pretty lucky this year. Um, seniors, you actually don't have to take it this year. Is this working? Um, you actually don't have to take it this year to get into most colleges, the um, Georgia colleges. However, we would suggest that you do that anyway because you never know what's going to happen. You never know if you're going to change your mind about which college you're going to go to. Um, it also counts um, towards scholarships. If you are planning on um, trying to do Zell Miller, they still require that minimum score for the Zell Miller. So if you are planning on using that or pursuing that, you need to be sure that you have taken your ACT. And you may want to take it early enough that you have time to retake it a couple of times in case you need to get your, your score higher. Um, we are getting ready to give the very first ACT of um, 2021. And if you've heard all the announcements, this Friday is the good timing because this Friday is actually the deadline to register for that. That's on February the 6th. So you still have time if you want to do that. Um, if you cannot do the February one, we have one in April, June, and they do give one in July. We don't normally give it here. We might, I'm not sure yet, but you can take that elsewhere. I'd rather you take it here. So for this year, that's the date so far if you need another one. Um, so if you'll look up here for just a second. So if you'll just go to, if you need to register, you just go to act.org and you just fill out some information for them. They're going to send you some info by email, text, different different ways, whatever you want. Um, tells you right here what you need, your computer, credit card, because you will pay online. Um, high school course details, you have to know, you know what classes you have right now. Put that in there. And the photos. So let me talk for a minute about a couple of those. Um, the credit card or payment info, if you are, um, if you are in any type of, if your family receives any assistance or if you qualify for free or reduced lunch here at school, you may receive um, a waiver, a fee waiver. 
and you can come talk to your counselor about that. That's private. You don't have to say anything to anybody else. Just come talk to your counselor, and we will um, talk to you about the fee waiver. So if you get a fee waiver, you'll just use that number online to pay. You don't have to pay anything. Also, if you qualify for an ACT fee waiver, you also qualify for college application fee waiver. So if you want that at the same time, we have another paper that is a college application fee waiver and we can give that to you as well. But you have to qualify for the ACT waiver to qualify for that. And um, I think a lot, of, a lot of kids don't know that and that's, you know, that's kind of a big deal. So that's the payment part. Um, headshot photo. If you will, um, there's just an app that you can download. It's called ACT Photo. And you just take a selfie, or you can upload a picture if you already have, or whatever. Um, and once you've logged into your account on that app, it will automatically put it on your ACT account. So that's all you have to do for your photo, and that will take care of that part of it. Because there's always a lot of questions about that, and people coming in there wanting to know how to get their picture uploaded, or how to get that taken care of. So that's the easiest way to do that, I think. Um, So if you want to study first, which I would recommend, and courses. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, so there's a lot of different resources for studying. Um, obviously you can go to bookstores or places around here and get study, uh, study guides, you know, actual books. But, um, but that's the first one right there, the ACT prep guide. You can, you know, you can buy that at Barnes and Noble or wherever online. Um, there are different subjects. If you are um, low in a particular subject and you just want to buy a subject area, um, regarding that, um, there's a new a new policy coming up um, in September of the next school year with the first test of the next school year. Um, we're gonna start doing retesting for sections. Um, never done that before, so let's say that you have to have you know, 26 in math to get into the college that you wanna go to. And you have really high scores and everything else, but you, 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 know, you just can't get that in math, but you gotta have that for your college. So normally you have to retake the whole test, which is a lot of money, a lot of time, Sometimes you just don't want to do it, so you just go to the next plan. Well, starting next school year, we're going to do retest by sections. So if you just need to up that math score or the English score or whatever, um, you can come and just take a subject area. So that's a really, a really, really cool thing that they're doing this next coming year. Um, it's going to be cheaper too. Also, um, they've started the super scoring. So when you retake those sections and that score changes, that's going to change your whole composite score because um, they're going to super score all your scores together. If you have any questions about that, you can ask your counselor. Um, so for more resources, um, when you go online, when you go to act.org, it will show you all these resources. Um, there's a lot of online resources. The um, official ACT live online class by Kaplan, so that's kind of virtual. We'll do that with you. Um, there's a self-paced course, and there's other things that you can work. So there, there's a lot of test prep. And if you want more than that, if you're like really, really serious, and you want more than that, we have um, like a name we can give you for um, help where you will pay. And you will actually go to this tutor that guarantees like, you know, so many points that he can help you raise in certain subject areas if you're really, really um, serious about it. So um, I think that's it for now. If you guys don't have any questions, anybody have any questions? Questions? Um, show of hands, who's actually applied already for the fall? Who's actually applied and they, they're going to pay like something like half the revenue? Out of those of you who have applied already, how many of you actually have an answer? You actually got an answer that you're going or not going. If the rest of you did not raise your hand, how many of you plan to apply to a college? And I don't necessarily mean UGA or something like that, but just something close to 
people, some more education, something to better yourself. Cool. College application process, pretty simple. About half of you already done it. About half of the other half said they were going to. It's really not that difficult. The thing you need to remember, this is, man, this never changes. We have this conversation every year with everybody because they're worried about their test scores. Um, I don't have the right ACT score that I want. Colleges aren't real worried about that right now. What they want you to do is go ahead and apply. They want you to apply as quick as you possibly can. And the reason being, if, uh, and I always use UGA as an example just because those numbers stick out. We get a lot of emails about those numbers. So we'll talk about UGA for a second. Um, anybody have any idea the current freshman class that are sitting in class right now? Well, actually, I'm not sitting in class because they're still on there. Uh, but the current freshman class at UGA, does anybody have any idea how many applications there were last year just for freshmen? Entrance. If they have any idea, just throw me a number out there at UGA. Are y'all weak? 19%. I don't even know what 19 is. 12 kids applied to UGA. Come on. How many do you think applied to get into the University of Georgia? Or freshman year? Other than 20. 30,000 students applied to get in at UGA. In the fall, out of that 30,000, how many got in? And that's where the percentage comes in. How many y'all think got in? 5,000. 5,000 out of 30. And I'm really not good. It's like 29 or something. I don't remember. Um, so we're talking about, about 20% got in. So that's a competitive school, a really competitive school for UGA. Now, I'm using that as an example for this reason. When you're applying to a competitive school like that, one of the reasons you want to apply early is because those 5,000 that get chosen, those are going to get first dibs at housing, scholarships, all that kind of stuff. So the quicker you apply, the quicker you get accepted. And a lot of schools now are doing early action. And early action is taking place October and November. So that's why a lot of these who raise their hand, they already know whether they got in or not to a lot of these schools. Uh, typically, we'll have this conversation with the class underneath you guys. You need to be ready to apply when you come back to school. And uh, we told y'all that. We told y'all that for several years. You need to be ready to apply when you come into your senior year. And um, so a lot of people already have answers. But the important part about that is you want to be first on the list, at least having a student ID number and be in their system so that you can have first opportunities at scholarships, housing, and that kind of stuff, if that's your plan to live on campus. Um, Scholarships is really one of the main reasons to do that in housing. Um, we'll slide into scholarships for just a second. Do um, you have any questions about how to apply to a school? Because it's not hard. I mean, everything is um, for almost every single college that we're aware of right now is online. I don't think any of them are paper copies of them. Um, even your two-year schools or less. These technical schools are all online. We, our responsibility as a school is simply to send the other information. We have your shop records. Uh, unless it needs to be updated, the school will let you know that, the college will let you know that, hey, we got it from a high school, but um, you're missing something, I don't know. Name a sh shop that they would have to have, I don't even know. Because uh, you, you guys have had everything by now. The only thing that might be required in the next year or two is the COVID vaccine. Let's see. I'm sure there's going to be a really stipulation for that as well. Um, but we take care of all that. All you guys have to do is apply and send your ACT scores if the, if the school requires it. Because Brown mentioned that for you guys, uh, the ACT is not required in the state of Georgia for University Board of Regents schools. And what I mean by that is a state school, a public state college, does not require as an entrance criteria for you to take ACT. However, if you're trying to get into a competitive school and you have taken the ACT, does that not put you in a level above those who have not? Yes, it does. And colleges will take that into consideration. It's not going to hurt you if you don't have it. They'll still consider you. 
but it's like putting your best foot forward. If you do have a score, go ahead and send it, even if it's not required. It's like when you're filling out a resume. You want to put everything you can possibly put on there to sell yourself for the job, in this case, to the school. Colleges want you, believe it or not. A lot of you have heard or you, know, you talk amongst yourself, you get the impression, man, it's just too difficult to get into school. It's really not as difficult as you think it is because a college wants to have your hiney sitting in the seat during the class. Why do they want that? Anybody have a clue why they want that? Money. If you're sitting there, they're getting paid by grandma's money, by mom and dad's money, by somebody's scholarship money, by Uncle Sam's money. Somebody's paying for you. So they want to help you get into the school as much as you want to get there. It's just there's more competitive school and you've got a bigger applicant pool like UGA with 30,000 kids. So you have to think about that. Um, if it's a competitive school, apply early. Those of you that have it, I encourage you to go ahead and get it done. Does anybody have any questions about application? Uh, I could talk about FAFSA, but that's really good. Um, I guess your uh, last seminar, I believe, Ms. Brown, you mentioned it, I might not have missed it, but did you get a fee waiver for ACT? Did you get a fee waiver for College Ad? Yes, okay. yes. Now, not all colleges accept the, the College Application Fee Waiver, uh, but nine times out of ten, they do. And it, sometimes it's just us signing it, Great question. Great question. All right, let's segue into financial aid. So you've applied to your school, which over half of you have done. Go ahead. Okay, so there was a question about applying, applying for school. Like, how many schools should I apply to, um, and what schools should I consider as a backup? Ah, good question. Uh, really good question. Now, and there is no specific right answer for you. Um, in general, what we have said over the years is we really think that most of you should apply. Now, a lot of you are like, well, this is the school I want to go to. I already have a line. This is where I want to go, that kind of thing. Especially those of you who have already accepted. I'm kind of bored this part. Uh, for the most part, two or three colleges is plenty. If you really want to throw yourself out there, you're, you know, you, you've got a specific – let me back up. A lot of times it really depends on what you want to do. I know there are those of you in this room right now who just apply to the school because that's the school you wanted to go to, which is fine. But what are you going to do with the degree that you get from that school? And we'll talk about financial aid in a minute. Um, I can talk about financial aid for hours, we just don't have an hour. Throw it out there. We are going to have a financial aid workshop later on, so we'll be diving into that later. We're just going to touch on it now. But it really is important for you to pay attention to what do I want to do? What is it that I want to do? We'll talk about of that tomorrow, a few signs. What do I want to do? Because if you're just choosing a school to go to because it's a cool school, that's fine. But you're going to be paying a lot of money to go to a cool school and get a degree that costs you a lot of money that you might have went in debt for, and then what are you going to do with it when you're done? So you really want to try to back up and pay attention and choose your school, which is, as counselors, what we try to encourage you to do. What is it that you want to do? What programs are you interested in? What kind of career are you interested in? And then you educate yourself in and then you start finding your schools based on what they offer you in those career fields. I've talked to several people who want to go in the medical field, but they don't want to be a doctor. You know, and then they're talking about going to Emory or something. Well, you don't need Emory if you just want to go to two or four year school to get some education to get into the medical field, radiology, uh, you know, whatever, nurse practitioner. You don't have to go eight years to do all that. So. You just have to kind of plan ahead. It's really talking and planning ahead. What do you want to do? You can go on later on and, and educate yourself more and earn more money and move up the career ladder in that field if you choose to. But if, if you have no idea, which most of us don't at this age, we, we just, hey, this is kind of what I want to do. This is where I want to go. I'm kind of interested in this field. Um, we'll talk about that with you signs tomorrow. Uh, but that's kind of what we, you know, two or three minimum. And then, yes, you always want that one. I, I, I always remember this one kid, very bright kid. You know what I'm talking about? Probably without even saying his name. It was his third or fourth year here. He was determined he was going to Duke. Duke was his only option. He was not applying to anywhere else. The kid was very bright. He 
He was very, very bright. He had great test scores. Guess what he didn't get in? Dude. Dude. Yeah, thank you. He didn't get in. And it was the only school he applied to. And he waited until like April to do anything else. So I think he went to do it like two years later. Uh, but he didn't get in. He got denied. Uh, and he had a great resume. We have no idea why a lot of colleges do what they do. I have seen students, we have seen students who are top 25, got a 28 on their ACT, and they get turned down for the uh, we, we have seen students make 19s and take only a minimum rigorous classes in high school and get into UGA. I, 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 I can't tell you exactly why they do what they do. I can only relay to you what they tell us. And it's about the rigor of your transcript. What were you offered at Greenville High School for four years, and then what did you choose to take? If you were offered a lot of these, and you only took these, then there's some competitive schools that you are just not going to get into. And you're not going to be surprised about that. We, we know that. Um, it, it happens. You know, I, I can dare say that many of you would never get denied at Dalton. And that's not to say that Dalton is not a good school, but Dalton's entrance requirements are below what the University Board of Regents minimum criteria are because they're a local school. They're trying to get kids in. They're not like UGA where you've got 30,000 kids trying to get in. So they want to allow people to come in. Again, if you're sitting in the seat getting educated at the college, what are they doing? I'm like, you get paid. Just about it. Uh, I'll add this about Dalton College, not to be a dead horse, but some of you are like, I never want Dalton College. And that's fine. Go ahead and get accepted as a backup because you don't know what the next four, five, ten years hold for you. Exactly. I've had friends, students, whatever, who applied to Dalton College, but they went off to somewhere else. Financial troubles hit their family. They had to come back to Dalton. They were already accepted. Easy breeze to get in there, already accepted, and it's cheap. And accredited. And tough. The toughest classes I ever took, two of them were Dalton College. Now, here's another option for those of you who want to talk. If you're not going to college, and our guys, we're going to talk about that tomorrow. But if you're going to college, here's what I did because I'm from Dalton and it's close. Three goals here. I became a transient student. You know what that term means? Transient student? I was enrolled at the University and University of Tennessee, but I would take the occasional summer class or two at Dalton College because I was accepted already as, as a junior and senior in high school. And I would take a summer class there and then I would transfer it to my university and then take it. And it was cheap. And I got saved money. And I got free quicker. So a transit student is what I did. They still do that. They still transfer that. So think about if you're going to come home for summer from your college and you want to pick up a class or whatever, do it all home. Go ahead and get accepted. $25, $35, $25, $25. And some days, your senior days, it comes out for free. Yes. yes. Always get accepted in your local college. I, I know two teachers right now at 30 years old who went back to class, thought they were going to have a career. One of them got married, one of them had a child, they dropped out of college because life. And they got ready to go back to Dalton College, which was there for them at 30 years old. They're both teachers now for 20 years. So don't, don't discount Dalton College as a possibility because you don't know what the future is. Okay? We've got teachers in this building who graduated from Dalton College. They're very successful at the school that we've raised on college. All right? That's my skill on that. All right? We have about 10 minutes left, so Mr. Simone is going to continue to talk about that. And whatever time we have left, we'll give you some downtime. Tomorrow, we'll be laid back again, and we'll talk about um, other options and other information. Instead of sitting in a rain, we'll have the number of time. I wish you All right, real quick, we'll just answer a couple questions. Do we have any questions so far for college applications? We will go into financial aid until tomorrow. Uh, there's something about transcripts. Um, send in your transcripts. A lot of you possibly have used uh, something online already. Uh, USA, US Features is one of them. Parchment is one of them. Uh, send, send to you is one of them. Uh, there's two or three others. But we typically will get the email. If you put our email address in when you request it, we'll get it and we'll go and verify it if we know it's done electronically. Uh, some of you have actually said, hey, the schools don't have my transcripts yet. If that's the case, they don't have them yet. I can guarantee you they probably do have them sitting in. It's in someone's computer somewhere. 
Uh, it just hasn't been updated, but if you want to send them again, come by the office. You can go to the front office or you can go by the counseling office. It's just a quick sheet of paper, just your name, you list the schools, and boom, we'll send it electronically. We'll make sure we send it and we get a tag knowing that we sent it. The school acknowledges that they've received it, so it's sometimes quicker that way than using some of these other online things because you just they never get it. Yes, ma'am. Oh, you're talking about like when you guys graduate? Yeah, at graduation, uh, we'll have a final transcript request form for all of y'all at one of the practices, or both. We'll have it at both of the practices, and it will say final transcript request. It never fails every year to get seniors who have just graduated in July, so they never got my stuff, and we don't have a request from them. They just didn't do it. Uh, they just forgot they didn't do it. So on the graduation practice days, uh, right before graduation, we'll hand it to you. You will fill out where you want it. And if you don't, just call the next couple of days and we'll do it. You know, shoot us an email. It's not difficult. We will not roll grades onto final grades onto um, the senior transcripts. Probably what's graduation twenty first. So I would imagine it's not going to be until like the first week of June that we'll roll those grades on there. So the colleges won't get the final transcripts until like the first week of June. So anytime up until then. Just don't forget to let us know where you want sent. I had one just the other day, and mom was like, hey, they still have a Kim song. Yes, because they never requested it. That's why they don't know. But yeah, we'll just ask us. Any of the counselors can do it. Uh, the front office, the registrar can do it. Uh, a lot of times, we'll just like, boom, send an email electronically, and that works. Because it's coming from us, so it's official still. Any questions about that? Any others? I think, so there's some questions about financial aid. Mr. Zavoto, can I go over that stuff tomorrow? I'll make sure we address these. And there's some people wanted, like, some individual help or just questions looking at their individual stuff. Um, so we can talk about that individually. And tomorrow, we are going to have some time tomorrow because uh, we will finish 20-ish minutes early on purpose. And we'll get you guys started on FAFSA, have you log in and create an account. You can actually create your demographics and then you can go home and work with about stuff, because uh, they'll have to put in financial information. Um, we'll talk about ACT if you want to tomorrow, we'll give you an opportunity to go ahead and sign up. We'll do all that tomorrow, specifically with about 20 minutes left on purpose so we can do that and help you guys. I mean, the goal is to make sure that you're leaving here with something done so that you don't have it over your head for the next three months, because that's not fun. Any got any questions at all? Any? It doesn't even have to be about school. Tonight, when y'all are home, you think of a question? The application for grants, loans, and work study funds provided by the federal government. It is also used by many states and schools for their financial aid programs. For the fastest and easiest way to apply, visit our official website, fafsa.gov. The FAFSA is available in English and Spanish. As you fill it out online, you'll be able to automatically skip questions that don't pertain to you, check out your status immediately, and get online help. It takes most people less than 30 minutes to complete the application. You'll need a few things when you fill it out, so get ready by gathering your social security number, your permanent resident card if you have one, any W-2 forms or records of money you earned for the previous year, and your tax records. By the way, a nice time-saving feature of the FAFSA is that many people are eligible to automatically transfer their tax data from the IRS into the FAFSA. So keep an eye out while you're applying in case you're offered that option. If you have any questions about what information to gather, there is a complete list of documents that you will need at FAFSA.gov. Before you begin the process of filling out the FAFSA, you should create a username and password called an FSA ID that will act as your electronic signature. You'll only need to create an FSA ID once, and you can use it to renew your FAFSA each year that you apply. Your parents will need an FSA ID too if they have to provide any information. So now you're ready to begin filling out the FAFSA to apply for financial aid. There are three groups of questions that include personal information, such as your name, address, and marital status, financial information, such as your income, and any parent information that is required. If you get hung up or confused about a question, the Help and Hints box on the right-hand side of the application can help with each question as you move along. 
Also, look for the online chat feature under Help if you'd like assistance from a knowledgeable agent. Because colleges and career schools use the FAFSA to provide financial aid, you can list up to 10 schools that you are interested in attending. You should list all the schools that you're considering, even if you haven't been accepted or applied yet. If you have more than 10 schools in mind, you can submit your FAFSA with 10 schools and then replace some of those schools with other schools later. When you finish filling out the FAFSA, use your FSA ID to sign the form. If you are required to submit parent information on your FAFSA, a parent will need to sign the application with his or her own FSA ID as well. If you have any questions or need more information, please visit studentaid.gov. All right, one thing to note. If you do have someone who's going to be paying for school, you know, your parents are like, look, we can, we can take care of you, you're just going to stay local, you know, we, we've got the money, we've been saving it for years, or grandma and grandpa, whatever, somebody's left money. If you're eligible for the Hope Scholarship or the Zimmer Scholarship, if you don't complete the FAFSA, you won't get the Zillmiller or the Hope Scholarship. That's how the funds are distributed, and it starts with completing the FAFSA. You have to complete that in order for the college to be able to connect with the state of Georgia to get the funds for you to go to school, and it's all based on your transcript. We had a question yesterday about when the transcripts, the final transcripts go through to the state, and that's gonna be like the first week of June. Well, all of that kind of takes place throughout the summer. So your final transcripts get uploaded from us to the state of Georgia through the Georgia Student Finance Commission's website. And they may do the calculations based on everything. We get a report that's unverified. We have to go back and make sure that everything's correct in case one of you had a wrong course number on there and it caused you to have a 2.999. Because if you have a 2.999, do you have the Hope Scholarship? No. They do not round up. And yes, we've had that happen in the past. So we have to verify all that. We make sure that you have the actual 3.0. And once that's uploaded to the state, the Georgia Student Finance Commission, all that good stuff, they do their connections. They make their, how they've set up the rules. But that's how the funds get distributed for you to have access to the Hope Scholarship and the Zell Miller Scholarship. So without this, you can have a 4.0 and have a perfect score of 36 on your ACT, but you won't get a dime from the Hope Scholarship or Zell Miller if you don't complete the FAFSA. So you have to have that part done. Um, do you know the difference between the Hope Scholarship and the Zell Miller? Anybody? One pays 100% of the tuition, Zell Miller, and one pays about 85% of the tuition. It's the Hope Scholarship. The difference is, like Ms. Brown was talking about yesterday, with the ACT, you have to have the 3.7 GPA and a 26 one-time test score. Yes. Yes. Great question. Hope Scholarship and Zell Miller in the state of Georgia, as far as state schools go, public schools that are governed by the, the uh, Board of Regents, it pays the percentage. So like I said, Zell Miller is 100% of the tuition to a state school. Hope Scholarship is 85% of the tuition to a state school. If you choose to go to a private school in the state of Georgia, they're listed on their website, but it's one lump sum. So if it's shorter, uh, what's another one? Barry, things like that. There's several others. Well, that's Tennessee. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, they pay a lump sum, 2500 or 3500 per semester, which is one lump sum per semester. And again, it's based, if it's Zell Miller, it's a little higher than Hope. Yeah, Mercer. Mercer's private. That's another one. Um, but yeah, it's not a percentage when it's a private school. It's a private school, it's one lump sum. Good question. Um, so, a lot of people yesterday said they don't know what their GPA is, so they're just not really sure if they're qualified for it yet. How do those people like, How do they know what their GPA is? Gotcha, gotcha. You can actually look it up this very second. You can go to the um, gafutures.org website because we upload y'all's information every semester. Every semester in the state of Georgia, in a public school, we upload student transcripts. It goes to gafutures.org, which is governed and owned and run by the Georgia Student Finance Commission.
And once you log in, most of you should have created an account in eighth grade. I won't remember all this stuff, but we've been working with you guys for several years, coming back and forth into that. But once you get back in there, uh, you log in and you can find your own. It's going to be under your profile, and it's going to be under the Hope GPA. There's a, um, a heading with Hope GPA. I'm not sure. Go to G. I think once you've logged in, it's going to be under the far right. Mind towards your futures. But that's where you can find your own. You can actually print that off, and it'll tell you exactly what your Hope GPA is. Hope GPA is only calculated using math, science, social studies, English, a foreign language, and a handful of elective classes that count in the state of Georgia as a fourth science. Anybody in here aware of what those are at Ringgold? Anybody have any idea what our sciences are or our fourth sciences are? Ms. Johnson teaches one computer science principles and AP computer science principles. Coach Williams has two of his, actually. Two of his in ag are considered a fourth science in the state of Georgia, plant science and animal science. Oh, my mind just went blank. Healthcare science with Ms. Gardner. Uh, that's essentials of healthcare. And by the way, in the state of Georgia, about three or four years ago, if you take Ms. Gardner's essentials of healthcare, because a lot of the curriculum is aligned with human anatomy, you get human anatomy credit on your transcript. So you get two credits for taking her class, for her essential healthcare class. Um, forensics with Coach Head, uh, that's another one, that's a fourth science. I feel like I'm missing one. Yes, anybody in the mechatronics dual enrollment stuff, uh, several of those actually count as fourth sciences. So those classes, Connor, actually will be figured in your HOPE GPA calculation, uh, or anybody else who's taken any of those that I just mentioned. Uh, another one is journalism. Journalism in the state of Georgia is actually an English course number. So we've actually encouraged students over the years. I, I, we know it's just the yearbook and that's what you do, but it's actually a great way, I have no problem saying this, to pad your whole GPA. Um, it's a great way to get a good grade in a class that you know you're going to be successful in and it's going to look great on your transcript. So we, that's kind of how we've sold that for years. For journalism. I think that's it as far as elective classes go. I can't think of any others. But we're adding them all the time. Every time CTA pathways have something new, we're trying to add new ones all the time. Um, and I know I'm fucking kind of rambling because there's so much to talk about with the FAFSA. Um, so you've completed the FAFSA, you've got on, you've created your ID and all that. It literally takes about a half an hour once you sit down with your parents, you get all your information. And they briefly mention that little. Uh, Crap, what they call it, the, the IRS data retrieval tool. That makes things so much easier. Your parents, all they need is uh, the code or a, a um, I can't remember what it is. Well, it's a PIN number, but it's when you complete your, your, your taxes, you complete the tax from the previous year, you get something that says you basically completed it. It's going to be on the thing that you get from the IRS, and you put that number in, and it actually retrieves all the information don't have to enter all this stuff. It, may, it takes it from about a 30 to 40 minute process to like a 20 minute process. It doesn't take years long. Before we leave here today, we're going to take time. Those of you who have not completed your FAFSA, we're at least going to let, get you logged in and get you started. You can fill out the demographics and that takes five minutes. It's just, you know, who you are, name, date, rank, and serial number, all that kind of stuff. It's easy stuff to do. But make sure you're putting in your correct social security number. So if you don't know it, don't guess. Because that'll jack stuff up. Same thing with when you're trying to get into Georgia Futures and look at your whole GPA. If you don't know your social security number or you're just guessing at it, it can kind of jack you up and lock you out. And then we'll get emails about it. Anybody have any questions so far about the fast one? It, it really is pretty simple. But there's zero ways to get money from anybody if you don't do it unless you just know somebody's going to write you a check. Uh, real quick with the fast food, there's grants and there's loans. Who knows the difference? Anyone? Who knows the difference between a grant and a loan? You get the paying back. There's subsidized and unsubsidized. Anybody taking economics yet? Know the difference between a subsidized and unsubsidized loan? We didn't talk about that in economics. 
One starts to accrue interest the moment you accept that first check. The other one, the interest is postponed until after you graduate. That's the difference. They will offer you a lot of money that you probably don't need all of it. And we can talk for days about stories that we all have and we all know of, of adults. Some in this building are still paying student loans. Some needed it, some didn't. They took out the max and they're still paying on some of them. Even though they are low interest loans, don't get me wrong, they're really good for what you need at the time. You'll be tempted to just hit click and take the whole $11,000 when you only needed like three. Um, but don't do it. You'll regret it. Trust me. Pell Grant. That's the number one grant from the government that the fast will tell you that you're eligible for. It's not a one-time thing, a one lump sum, one thing. The maximum is $6,100 a year, and it's based on your expected family contribution. Um, but there are levels of the Pell Grant. You may not get the whole $6,100, you may get half, you may get three quarters, you may get a quarter of it. But you may get some. Some of you may not get any at all. Um, some of you may get all of it. It's all based on your information that you put in. It's all based on financial need. So we got grants, we got loans. It will also tell you about uh, Parent Plus loans that they can get. They're 1% interest loans. It's a last thing once there's been a, a grant, scholarships, and all kinds of loans. If there's a little bit of money that's still needed, the government offers what's called Parent Plus loans. It's strictly in your parents. And it has nothing to do with you. It's all about what they're willing to do, but it's a 1% interest loan. Um, those are all of that information you will find out when you complete the FAFSA. So you've completed the FAFSA. So, you filled out the FAFSA. Now what? The information you submitted will be processed by the U.S. Department of Education's Office of Federal Student Aid, and the colleges or career schools you listed will be notified so they can begin their process of awarding aid. The great thing about filling out the FAFSA online is that you can check its processing status immediately. This comes in handy when you're thinking, I wonder if it went through. Within a few days of filling out the FAFSA, You'll get your student aid report, or SAR. You'll hear that abbreviation again, so just remember, your SAR is your student aid report. Basically, it summarizes all of the information you submitted on the FAFSA. You can access your SAR online at fafsa.gov using your FSA ID, which is your username and password. Check your SAR for any mistakes. Then make corrections if you need to but only if you estimated your tax information or provided incorrect information the day you filled out the FAFSA. On your SAR, you'll see reference to your EFC, or Expected Family Contribution. This number is used to determine your eligibility for federal student aid. It doesn't mean you actually have to contribute that amount. The financial aid office at each college or career school you list on your FAFSA will receive your information. Each office will then use your FAFSA information to determine how much aid you can get at that school. It's possible that your college or career school may require you to verify the information you submitted on your FAFSA. If that happens, your school will tell you what you need to do. Once you're accepted into a college or career school, you'll get an award letter from the school's financial aid office that explains the aid being offered to you. We recommend comparing award letters from multiple schools. That way you can make the best decision for your situation. If you have any questions about your financial aid offer, Contact the school's financial aid office. If your aid offer includes a federal loan and you're a first-time borrower, there are a few more steps before you get your loan. You'll need to complete entrance counseling and sign the Master Promissory Note, or MPN, which is your agreement to pay back the loan. Your school will provide you with the necessary information. So how do you get your money? Well, usually your grants and loans will be applied to tuition, fees, and other charges on your student account first. Then any leftover money is paid to you. Work-study funds are earned throughout the term. Remember, filling out the FAFSA is not a one-time thing. You must complete it every year you attend school. If you have questions or need more information, please visit studentaid.gov. Any questions? 
Again, I understand there's probably... What so, is, you filled out about half of you guys that have done it already. The info Maybe a little bit more than half that haven't. And what I would like to do, we need to do it now, we can wait till the end. What do you want to do? Want to wait? Get through everything else first? Um, we, can, we can do the way I'm going to say this first. I want to encourage you about... I'm not sure if Mr. Spoke is going to talk about it or not, but I'll probably to jump in. When I applied for college, I did not get the Pell Grant. I got offered a bunch of loans. So my tuition was X amount, whatever it was. And so I did take out a few loans along the way. We've got, we all know friends, like you talked about, that took the, they got new car fever and took out every loan that was offered, paid their tuition with it, got in debt for all this stuff, and still paying back loans now, 45 years old. When they should have driven the old car for a few more years to get a new car paper or whatever. Now, there are some kids, and I was one of them, I had to take loans just to get through. I had, I had no choice, no option. I had to. But thank goodness I never took the max. I only took what I needed to pay for that deal, and I didn't keep the rest because I didn't get Pell Grant. I didn't get any Pell Grant. What I did get offered through FASA, which all of you might be offered, it's a great program, it's called Work Study. Work study pays you a salary to work for the college. 10, 20, 15 hours a week, whatever you can, works on your schedule, and you work for the college. My job was the media center. I got assigned to the media center. So I worked 15, 20, 25 hours a week, whatever the limit was, or the max was, and I got a check every every pay period from the college. And it was 50, 60, 70, 80, 100, 100 dollars a week, whatever I worked for my spending money. And I could study while I was working for the college, which is the case in most colleges. So in order to get work study, it has to come through passive. All right? So, and even if it says that your parents are expected to pay $20,000 towards your, uh, your uh, tuition, and they can't, your only option might be a loan. Let me caution you, be careful. Because you're going to be 40, year old, 40 years old one day, just the blink of an eye. And you want this least amount of debt that you could possibly incur. Drive that old car for a few more years. Bump with somebody for a few more years. Don't get those college loans unless you absolutely have to. That's the best advice I can give you. And I'm old and I know because I'll be free. Okay? That works so you can help get some spending money. You know, it's funny, but you can probably, if faculty is willing to talk to you about it, and I think most of them are, I don't know if you will find anybody our age or any of the teachers in this building that would actually say to you, oh, yeah, that's the best move I ever made, maxing out my loans. I can tell you, I don't think there's any of them. Not one that would ever say that's the best move they ever made. Yes, I, I wish I had listened to what they told me, but I didn't have to take it all. But see, they don't tell you that when they send you this sheet, you just see this huge chunk of money. And I mean, heck, if I'm 18 or 19 and I see this huge chunk of money, I'm signing. I want it all. But you need to listen to the people around you. You, you take what you need. You know, don't take the whole amount because they'll offer you I think it's each semester, it's 11,000, because it's 5,500 or 55 and 45, and I can't remember the split, in unsubsidized and subsidized. They're called staffer loans, and it'll be 5,500 of one and 4,500 of the other. So you're talking about 10 grand. I think it's every semester of your undergraduate year. <laughs> and then when you go back to do your master's or your anything, plus your, your bachelor's, it's actually to offer you more than that because that college is more expensive. And that's where a lot of folks we know went in debt even further because they went and got their masters and just took it all. So just please be aware of that. And a good point with the work study, somebody mentioned uh, private schools. There's a lot of private schools that offer. That's how they are able to get more students in because clearly when you see the fees at a private school, you're gonna go, holy Lord, there's no way I can afford to go there. But once you've completed the FAFSA and you start to communicate with the financial aid offices, and this is at any college, not just private, but specifically for work study, the private schools can somehow, I don't know how they got it worked out, but they offer more for students when it comes to work study. I know Shorter, for example, 97% of the students who are attending Shorter are doing some sort of work study. They've got some sort of their tuition paid for and fees through work study at Shorter. And Shorter is pretty expensive because it's a private school. But it's very affordable if you go through the process. Financial aid office at the college that you're planning to attend should be on your phone. You should, you should have that number on there once you apply. You should be communicating with them weekly to figure out what it is you need to do next. Hey,
real fast, the one thing I meant to say about the, the FAFSA is that there is zero deadlines for the FAFSA. The FAFSA does not have a deadline. However, there's not like this just bottomless pit of money. Each school has a kind of a set amount that they're able to give out to students every year. So the quicker you get the FAFSA done, the quicker you find out how much you can get from the school. Because at some point, you know, you, sit, you wait till April, May, and June to fill it out, and you're fixing to start school in like August, all the funds may be gone of what you may be eligible for. Each school has like, okay, if you have this, this, and this, you meet this criteria for this scholarship, but if you wait till the last minute to get it, all those funds are gone whether you made a perfect score on the ACT or not. Does that make sense? So don't wait. Get it done as quick as possible. And one last thing, and this is just about us as counselors, if you guys need a recommendation letter or something from us for one of your colleges for a scholarship or just for an application to school, and what we need from y'all is what we like to call a brag sheet. There's some of you that we spend time talking to days and days on end over the years, and some of you we just back and forth pleasantries over the years because you don't need us for that much. But if you needed uh, a recommendation from us and you've put our email address in and we get this thing saying we got to fill this out, please send an email to us. You can, you can just bullet point. You can just scribble it out. I don't care how you do it, but if you send it to an email in a, to us, send it in an email to us, each one of us, if you want a recommendation letter for us, we call it a brag sheet. Just brag on yourself for the four years you've been in high school. These are all the awards I've won. These are all the community service hours I've got. These are all the things I've been involved in. Anything you can think of. Brag on yourself. Paint a picture. And we can make it look good in the letter. Thank you. All right. Why not these numbers just come on down and then just pick your stuff and just slip back and forth during the presentation. Up next, if you're not going to college or if you are going to college, you're going to have to ask somebody for a job someday. You're going to have to ask them. And if you have the same credentials as the person beside you, they're going to hire the person who gives the best impression, interview. And you have to be able to talk about yourself without being arrogant or without going, oh, no. All right? So, you science coming up, great information. This is a handlebar that will carry you through a lot of situations in your life. All right, I need 287, 258, 301. Just come on down here leisurely while Mr. Johnson's talking. You got your prize and go back. We're informal here. It doesn't matter. There you go. Hey, I'm going to talk about U-Science real quick. Oh, um, so U-Science, you guys did it as a freshman. So it's been a long time for a lot of you guys. Three and a half years, four and a half years. And back when we did it, I don't know if you guys got like the best analysis of it, right? We didn't spend all the time like here to career and other class spends on it now. Um, so U Science is an x-ray of yourself almost, and it looks at your aptitudes. So there's aptitudes and interests. Interest is things that you like, um, whether that's a sport, whether that's something that like, you just enjoy being around. But aptitudes are things that you're naturally good at. Aptitudes don't change over time, right? I'm still right-handed just like I was 10 years ago. Um, aptitudes are more like personality things. Aptitudes are things that allow you to be really good at something. And what we say is that you should have a job, you should probably go to college too, and build on what your strengths already are. So when you look at your science results, it's not saying that these are the jobs that you have to do, but these are the ones that might come naturally to you, okay? So that analogy of an extra, I think is so important. And um, when we introduce this in like from here to career, we tell this story and it's about the x-ray. And if you think about that imagery you go with, right, we've all had x-rays, right? You have an x-ray when you go to the dentist. You have an x-ray if you break an arm. And if doctors didn't have that x-ray or the dentist didn't have that x-ray, you'd be wasting time, you'd be wasting money. Um, the dentist would poke around in your teeth, your cavity might turn into a um, root canal, your broken arm might turn into a surgery, or surgery might come up too late. Like, all this time gets wasted. And the story that goes along with this is way, way back in, like, 1880, uh, president William Garfield is like walking through a train station and he gets shot, right? So it's the president and he gets shot and they call him the best doctor that they can find. And this guy's name is Dr. Henry Bliss. And Dr. Bliss goes to work on the president and like he's shot. He's like, we need to get this bullet out, right? It's after the Civil War and everything. So he goes to take out the bullet and he does surgery and he can't get it out. He does surgery again, he does surgery again, and then it's over the course of days, he's going to surgery. And then this guy called Thomas Edison comes. Edison knows himself about uh, um, X-ray. Also, he had a telephone, right? Um, but he had an X-ray. He's like, yo, use this X-ray. 
was just like, I don't need to x-ray. So he does surgery again and again. Then this doctor called Dr. Liston comes up. Dr. Liston was the guy that earned this award. He was like, we should wash our hands before we do surgery on people. And we should like clean our tools before we do surgery on people. And we should not use the same tools. And Dr. Liston's like, I don't need that stuff, right? So he does surgery again, he does surgery again. And for 79 days, he does surgery and pokes and prods around the president's body. At some point, he does some x-ray, but he doesn't really know how to use it, so he uses it on the wrong side. Eventually, Garfield gets this infection and he dies. So it wasn't the bullet when he got shot that killed him. It was that he had this Dr. Bliss that was ignorant, that was a quack, that didn't want to use an x-ray, didn't want to look inside. He just wanted to get straight to work. Okay, so now we got the same. The same as ignorance is bliss, and it comes from this, right? So ignorance is bliss because of this guy. So if we think about where we are in our life, there's probably never a time in our life where we're going to get as many people that are willing to help us as we have right now, right? Probably have your mom and your daddy that are paying for stuff, or at least help them with that. If you're in school, you have counselors that can help you figure out school. You're about to go to college. You go to college, there's so many people that can help you. When you need to write a resume, they probably have a whole department. When you're in freshman English and you're having trouble, there's a writing center that will help you with that stuff. Um, when it comes time to pick a major, there's whole academic advising departments that will help you with that. But then one thing that we have for you right now that you can look at is your new science. So if you will, I'd ask you to take out your Chromebook, and I'm going to show you how to log into new science. So once you get your Chromebook out, and it's going to be easier for a Chromebook, go to Parent Portal. On Parent Portal, you need to sign in as a student. Sometimes people use their mom or their parents, or they don't do that. So we'll go to the school website. Up at the top, it says Parents. You log in Parent Portal. A lot of y'all probably have this thing already, right? And then once you get there, the username is your lunch number, and then the password is your first initial or your last initial. Most of y'all, it's your page. It might be six digit for some of you, but probably eight digit birthday. And if you need something, Ms. Johnson's walking around, Mr. Fair State, you might get logged in. You'll go to the left side, and see where I have the yellow box? That's around the word more. So on the left side of your parent portal, it'll say more. If you're on your phone, you might have to click something to make that pop out. But it's the very bottom, and it says more. Then after you do that, it'll take you to this screen. And on the right side, it says SLDS portal. SLDS. And this is where the state stores like all your student information, the old test scores and stuff like that. And then once you've done that, you'll have this screen and it says my career plan. And it's a long version that we have to have this for you. So even since I was middle school, this has been building for you guys. And once you click on my career plan, it says go to U-Science, and you can click that link, and it'll open up your U-Science. This is the last time you'll have to go in that way. There's some easier ways.
Okay, so once you walk in and you sign, you probably have a screen like this, okay? The first thing that I would do is I would add an email address that's not your school email address, and it will let it'll send you an email from that, and this will help you access it. For 10 years, you can get to this. You can access it through SLDS for that one, but the best thing is up at the top, see where it says, hi Carter. Um, how it says, hi Carter, and then there's a little icon. You can go to my account, and you can add a secondary email. I put like your, your home Gmail account, right? Or iCloud account, something like that. It'll send you an email, and there will be a link where you can get to it in the future. And while you are doing that, I'm going to show this video, and it gives a brief science overview. Congratulations on completing New Science Snapshot. Now it's time to explore your results, which you can access on your phone, tablet, or a computer. To log into your New Science account, go to newscience.com and click on the blue login button in the top right corner. Once you're logged in, the first thing you'll see is a welcome message about your talent and the awesome opportunities ahead of you. Start exploring your results by reading about your top two talents at the top of the screen. To learn more about what these talents are, scroll down to the aptitude wheel or pie. The largest pieces of this pie show you what your strongest talents are. For example, this student's strongest aptitude is in visual comparison speed. You can read more about what that means in the box here on the right. Your visual comparison speed is how quickly and accurately you notice differences between written symbols. This student can see here that he's a natural proofreader and he has a quick visual radar that allows him to scan documents or forms to locate errors. You can also click on the other pieces of that pie to read about your additional abilities. After you explore your aptitudes, you can learn more about your top three work interest areas or the things you enjoy doing. For example, this student's top three interest areas are in artistic work, investigative work, and realistic work. That means he's interested in careers where he can work creatively, conduct research, and work with his hands or in a job that requires physical activity. Remember that these interest will likely change over time as you get older and are exposed to more careers. After you explore your interest results, click on the drop-down menu in the top left corner to toggle down to your career cluster matches. These are the best career field matches for you based on your unique aptitudes and your interests. The career industry groups at the top of the screen are your strongest matches based on your snapshot results. So you're encouraged to explore these first. Look through both your best fit clusters based on your interests and your aptitudes. Click on any of the career clusters to explore more careers within that cluster. From here, you can select any career to read more about it, including what a day in the life looks like in that career and core tasks for the career, or what you will be doing on a daily basis. You can also see expected job openings and salary information across the country and in your state. And you can see educational investment information or how many years you need to be in school to pursue a specific career. At the bottom of this page, you'll view a list of industries that hire people for this specific job. If you're interested in a career and want to save it, Make sure you click on the green Save Career button at the bottom of the screen. You can always access your saved careers by clicking on the drop down menu and then Save Careers. Have fun exploring your snapshot results and be sure to share them with a parent or a mentor. Okay, so, some people have hesitation with this, right? Because I took this four years ago, is it really relevant? And you're supposed to think about it this way. Think about if you're left-handed or right-handed, right handed right handed So maybe the first time their mama throws Cheerios out on their high chair, 
they reach for the Cheerios with the left hand or right hand, right? Or even in the cradle, they reach for it a certain way. When you're a little kid and you're playing T-ball and you're figuring out which hand you throw with, it's left or right. And you still use your left or right hand. Um, it's all based on the way that your brain naturally does stuff the easiest way, the aptitudes. Um, so this stuff is not changed. I know three people that retook the test, two because like the mom just been able to take it, and they had to pay for it. It's like 50 bucks if you pay for it. Their results were the same. And not even like kind of different. I mean, it was 98% the same. So this stuff does not change. Um, I want to show you real quick, I'm going to go over the partners, why the most important parts. Okay, so first it has the aptitudes, and they show you that in the video, and it tells you your talents and things you're good at. Um, so that's an in five patterns. If you think when you were in kindergarten, you took the kindergarten test, and you're looking at those patterns of the circle shape, squares, uh, circle, shape circle, square, triangle, whatever, like those people, they're still good at pattern recognition. It doesn't change. So it has these aptitudes and it tells you what your talents and strengths are. It tells you if you're an introvert or extrovert, how you can work on a team. All this stuff is there and it's so valuable if you'll go through it. The biggest part that's probably most valuable to you right now, or the two biggest parts, is first it has careers. And it'll tell you some good careers that you would um, do well with, right? It has the three circles, if you're a strong fit, if you go way, 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 way down, it has like two circles and so on. Once you click on one, yeah, okay. Um, and once you click on one, it tells you about that career. It tells you how you fit into that career, your aptitudes. And it tells you some related careers, how much money they make, how that school works. So all this is there. So if you're trying to think about a college major, this would be good. And then the last part that's relevant to us now is when you go into this describing section. So if you think about when you're writing a college essay on the Common App, and it has you know, the whole tell, your, tell the intro questions, or if you think about when you go to a job interview for the first time, and every job interview is always going to start out with a tell me about yourself, right? That's your chance to make a pitch, that's a chance to sell yourself, that's a chance that you should be prepared for. And these are terms that you can use to tell them about yourself. And this isn't just some made up thing, right? This is like a scientific proven way that you should feel confident when you say these things. If you think about filling out a resume and you have to put what your skills are, or if you think about a cover letter when you're applying for a job and you're looking for fancy words to say, um, this is kind of copy based stuff that you can 